like that. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming out this second day of spring. Uh, my name is Jim Wilson. I am the executive director of CLAGS. Uh, and before I turn over the program to our guest of honor, I just want to say a few things about CLAGS. First of all, again, thank you for uh, supporting CLAGS being here tonight. Uh, we also hope that if you haven't already, you uh, pick up our glossy calendar. Uh, we've got a full lineup this spring. Our next event is a screening of Transvisible, the Bambi Salcedo story. Uh, we have a um, series that we're very proud to continue, the Performing Queries. Uh, this year we will have a reading of a play called Unnatural Acts about the Harvard scandal in the 1920s, uh, which we think will be quite exciting. Uh, we will host an evening uh, with Peggy Shaw in conversation with Benjamin Gillespie, our events coordinator, and we will also welcome Mart Crowley, the uh, playwright of Boys in the Band in May. So you won't want to miss any of those events. Uh, we do hope that you will consider donating to CLAGS. If you haven't already, um, please do so. You can see one of our staff members. You can go to our website and contribute. Uh, Truthfully, these events couldn't happen without the generous support of our donors. So if you've given, thank you, and um, we beg you to give even more if that's at all feasible. Um, uh, and the money also goes to support the number of fellowships, which Chris Eng uh, will tell you about in a minute, because uh, our event tonight is made possible because of one of our uh, fellowships that we offer. So please go to the website and see the variety of fellowships that we offer to emerging scholars, to uh, established scholars, uh, to graduate students, and to students in CUNY and SUNY. Uh, so there are lots of opportunities available. Uh, at this point, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the evening, Chris Eng. Chris is a member of the CLAGS board, and he has been a uh, tremendous uh, help to CLAGS in terms of running the fellowships committee last year. Uh, this year, he has been uh, coordinating the programming committee with Benjamin Gillespie. So let me introduce to you Chris Eng, who will introduce our speaker. Thanks, Jim. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much again for joining us tonight. Just a quick note, we are being live streamed. Um, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Ng Ben Lim and to hear him present from his new book today. Ng Ben Lim is Assistant Professor of Theater Arts and Performance Studies at Brown University. A testament to the transnational and interdisciplinary nature of his thinking, Lim is a faculty board member of Gender and Sexuality Studies at the Pembroke Center for Teaching and Research on Women. Um, and affiliated with the Department of American Studies, Department of East Asian Studies, and the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. He has lectured widely and his work has appeared in Theater Journal, um, Asian Theater Journal, Modern Drama, Theater Survey, and Social Text, where he is a member of its editorial collective. His numerous prestigious fellowships and awards include those from the American Society for Theater Research, Association for Theater and Higher Education, the Woodrow Wilson Foundation, the Mellon Foundation, and from CLAGS. So last year, as a board member of CLAGS who chaired the fellowships committee, I had the honor and the privilege of reviewing the submissions for CLAGS, the CLAGS Fellowship Award. And as um, Jim mentioned, Yes, there are fellowships and awards. Please visit the website. There's money out there to be had. Submit your work. We're very happy to review all of them. Um, so as Jim can attest, we received many, many submissions for the CLAGS um, fellowship, and quite a number of outstanding ones, too. Um, but Ng Ben's was truly exceptional. Published last year by NYU Press, Ng Ben Lim's award-winning Brown Boys and Rice Queens Spellbinding Performance in the Asia's um, please pick up a copy um, later at the end of the event if you haven't done so already. Um, <clears throat> astutely acquires into how we know what we know about Asian performance and its transnational encounters with the signs of the colonial, native, global, and queer. 
Mapping out his personal and intellectual journeys, Lim elucidates how the fields that engage with these terms of analysis, primarily Asian studies, U.S. ethnic studies, post-colonial studies, queer studies, theory, and performance studies, fail to account for the intimate ways in which they rub up against one another. Particularly, he convincingly argues that the absent presence of the queer coupling between the Western colonial man and the native brown boy both structures and unsettles our disciplinary encounters with these terms. For Lim, this dyadic formation, which manifests as conceptual, historical, and sexual couplings, is not just an interpretive framework, but also a mode of performativity and a structuring condition of colonial modernity. Examining the spellbinding performances through which the, this dyad concretizes multiple Asias, Lim's book explores the transformation of the white man brown boy dyad in colonial Bali, post-colonial Singapore, and the diasporic Asian America as demonstrative of the key roles queerness, performance, and coloniality play in coalescing these Asias. Along the way, the book generously offers us with what um, Lim calls assemblies of interpretation that enact a queer politic for survival by presenting alternative modes of reading that illuminate ways of thinking, sensing, and feeling otherwise. Brown Boys and Rice Queens is an urgent call for us to question how disciplinary methods and protocols dictate what constitutes proper modes of inquiry and acceptable objects of analysis. Towards this end, the book takes its lead from, its often, from the often invisibilized brown boys who are not merely objects of analysis for limb study, but rather respected interlocutors and key theorists whose performances demand that our intellectual work explore, create, and proliferate the modes of survival they practice. Lin's book is invaluable, generatively opening spaces for survival within our fields of inquiry and illuminating the already existent encounters between our disciplines and also staging the conditions that can make other encounters possible. Please join me in welcoming and bring them to the Graduate Center. Good evening. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Chris. I'm so delighted to be here at CLEX um, and CUNY, where um, I, have so, I have so many of my favorite thinkers are here, including Candice Chu, Jim Grant jo Jones, Marvin Carlson, David Severin. I'm just so excited and so honored to be here. I want to thank Jim, Ben, Chris for facilitating my visit here. Um, and I, I, I want to say I'm just so honored um, to be uh, received, to have received the Clax Award uh, for my first book, and having relied on the kindness of strangers for most of my life, I was a little taken aback that I didn't have to sleep with anyone to get this award. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to the committee members and the board members who voted for me. Um, to quote Lupita Nyong'o, um, no matter who you are and where you're, you're from, your, your dreams are valid. For those who didn't vote for me on the committee, <laughs> and whoever you are, I don't like you either. <laughs> but seriously, um, I, I, I'm beyond thrilled to be here and really so delighted to get this award. So for those of you who have read the book sleeve, um, you'll know that the book is about the homoerotics of Orientalism, using the brown boy and rice queen as its performative gambit for reading Asian performance writ large. Contemporary accounts of brown boys and rice queens are often organized around the affective ballast of their respective identities, and insofar as they are understood only as identities, you always find a cagey rice queen and a degreeved brown boy um, who is over or under identification or valuation of the racial agenda vis-a-vis -vis gay pleasure and pain is bound to generate narratives of affection and abuse, patronage and subterfuge, exemplified by the Grinder Douchebag website that publicly shames those with the audacity to use racial selection for their sexual preference, or the obligatory annual gay blog by I Am Yellow Man is Justin Chin on Huffington Post, whose title should give us pause, Why Don't Asians Want Each Other? But what if we were to approach rice queens and brown boys not as identities, but as tropes and uh, a shifting set of spells, identifications, 
and positionalities um, that is also sexual, conceptual, ethnographic, and performative. So what I want to do today is to give you three sites which are explored in the book in which I um, read them through the, the, uh, the diet's contrivance, contrivances and to figure out how an attention to this diet might give us a different way of thinking about the performance historiography of Asian uh, traditions and also the queer epistemologies in a post-colonial and transnational context. So, without further ado, let's go to Bali. Um, one, of the, one of the nativized rituals that have become iconic of the island's cultural tradition is Ketchak, which is the YouTube video that I played while you were coming into um, the room. And the Balinese performance at the heart of my opening chapter. Now, widely known to tourists as the monkey dance, Ketchak features a large Balinese male chorus performing a polyrhythmic chant with synchronized gestures and throbbing bodies in a multi-layered circular structure. Much of his appeal centers on the transmogrification of the man into entranced monkeys from the Ramayana epic. Ketchak and its possessive embodiments is a key analytic of the tropic spell cast by or cast upon the brown boy rice queen dyad. It enables a reading of the ritual's choreography as the interplay of colonial, indigenous, and queer crossings. Such crossings of the dyad inflect colonial power with a queer cognate fraught with paradoxes and of several implications for studies of race and sexuality as it pertains to performance in the Asias. The spell is thus a different kind of magic than the one generated by the colonial mandate or its cognate anthropological gaze, which together resulted in the rapid exoticization of the island's cultural tra traditions. Now, even as Ketchak, which you see on the screen, is performed as a secular dance, Spectators are charmed by the tantalizing assumption that it is a trans ritual that serves as a magical portal to the island's religious and cultural essence, a primitive Balinese experience as it were. Tapping into such a popular imaginary, Ketchak is often used to reify Bali's spiritualized exoticism as tourist spectacle. Pictures of Ketchak are iconic of the tropical paradise of this tropical paradise and can be found in myriad books, postcards, and films on Bali. In Ketchak's most vivid image, the density of possessed Balinese male bodies huddled closely together, bare chest to bare chest, invokes a queer memory from the 1930s when its choreography is formalized as part of an island-wide paradisal transformation that started more than two decades prior to its invention. Following tourist brochures produced as early as 1914 that hailed the island as the Garden of Eden and Enchanted Isle, Bali seems seamlessly interpolated as the exemplar of paradise throughout the 20th century and in contemporary discourse. From travel literature, The Last Paradise in 1930, musical theater and film, Bali High in Rogers and Hammerstein's South Pacific in 1940s and 50s, scholarly publications, Bali, A Paradise Created in 1989, and The Dark Side of Paradise, Political Violence in Bali, 1995, to newspaper headlines, Paradise Lost, 2002. These paradisal representations tell the story of colonial fantasy, possessive vision, and transnational love. It is an orientalist story that is, most, mo that is mostly understood through the figure of the brown woman, um, uh, and this is a picture of a Legong dancer um, and the Legong uh, dance is very iconic of um, the performing uh, art traditions from Bali and since the gender of Bali is produced by the dominant discourse is female and Bali as a woman is subject to the um, western male gaze of patronage and penetration the female Legong, Legong dancer one of the most iconic dance forms in Bali shown here is representative of, the gen of this gendered imaginary or romance. Meanwhile, the queer erotics of the colonial encounter, and in particular, the figure of the brown boy imbricated in Bali's cultural transformation as paradise are obfuscated in the mix of hetero fantasy, possession, and love. 
But among the glittering orbit of visitors attracted to this tropical Shangri-La in the 20s and 30s is a queer caste not known for their fidelity to orthodox practice such as Noel Coward and Charlie Chaplin, as well as Colin McPhee, Margaret Mead, and many others. They form an influential group of stars and scholars, writers, and artists whose time in Bali created a cultural legacy that reverberates across the world of performance from Broadway musical to Hollywood film, as well as ethnomusicology, anthropology, modern art, and photography. By the 1930s, when Noel Coward turned Charlie Chaplin to tell him in a witty ditty about the, sur about the surfeit of artistic endeavor in Bali, reports had been filtering out to Europe and America that the island, not Fiji or Samoa or Hawaii, was the genuine unspoiled tropical paradise. And here is the ditty that, here's a quote from that ditty. As I said this morning to Charlie, there is far too much music in Bali. And although as a place it's entrancing, there is also a thought too much dancing. It appears that each Balinese native, from the tomb to the womb, from the womb to the tomb, is creative. And although the results are quite clever, there is too much artistic endeavor. Coward's wry profession of magic about the Balinese native, at once a kind of Asian encounter and a colonial spell is also a queer repartee between two men undoubtedly among the cognoscenti on vacation in Bali. Well, one can only guess if the generic or gender ambiguous Balinese native so central to the island's magic is a brown woman, brown boy, or both, it is clear that a colonial dyad is involved in the making of this native's creative queerness from the womb to the tomb. At the center of this charm circle is German expatriate artist, Walter Spies, whose cafe salon is the epicenter of their Balinese encounters. As the charismatic host, Spies led his visitors to what he deemed were the most authentic parts of Balinese life, such as cockfights and trans rituals. Those fell binding encounters then became the basis of their creative or scholarly and often very personal output. Now Spies, as you know, um, as some of you know, was instrumental in the Balinese Pavilion at the 1931 Paris Exposition uh, World's Fair where Anthony Acteau saw the Balinese dancers and went on to write his very famous treatise that have influenced the, the Western avant-garde movement thereafter. Their letters, photographs, films, and ethnographies helped to concretize the grand colonial narrative of the island as a beautiful but politically bankrupt dreamland sustained by such spiritual and romanticized precepts as balance, harmony, order, and happiness. This thriving Balinese cultural industry is a colonial legacy, and Spice Salon was an important acolyte, particularly for tourism, which gained momentum in the 1920s after, after the Dutch successfully engineered an elaborate makeover of Bali as an harmonious, exotic, and apolitical tropical island. As part of a carefully planned colonial program that conflated tradition with forms of primitive nativism, a traditional Bali was imaged reiterate, reiteratively through its indigenous art and spiritual practices. The familiar picture of a smiling Balinese native preoccupied with spiritual practices and artwork was thus embedded deeply in the cultural imaginary of Bali. This policy of cultural transformation and containment was, as bizarre as it sounds, an act of atonement for the massacres at Badong in 1906 and Klang Kong in 1908, which secured Bali for the Dutch colonials. By disciplining Bali with the arts, the island was dramatically transformed from a place where everyone was, quote, savage, perfidious, bellicose, unquote, to one where, quote, everyone is an artist, unquote. Bali was one of the last islands to be subjugated by the Dutch as part of its aggressive and punitive territorial expansion in the region. Spies's queer vision or perversion of Bali was instrumental in securing the Dutch imaginary of Bali as paradise. In particular, 
his relationship with the Balinese male youth, from which Ketchak is consequently produced, is central to this imaginary. In Dance and Drama in Bali, a book Walter Spies co-authored with Beryl de Zeta in 1938, the homoerotic appeal of Ketchak's progenitor form, the Czech chorus in Sangtiang, or God-inspired trans dance, was tellingly noted. The exorcistic circles of sitting men were, quote, naked except for a small loincloth and wearing fantastic freshly woven hats adorned with flower garlands of every hue, unquote. The attraction of the man was evidently found in the presentational allure, a nativized spectacle of men decorated with flowers and fantastic hats and arranged in exorcistic circles. This all-male Sangtiang Czech chorus, to which Spies referred as the voice gamelan, was the trans accompaniment that he would subsequently develop into Ketchak. Now, there were a, double, there were a couple dozen Sangtiang dances in Bali featuring a mixture of female and male chorus and boys and girls, as shown in this picture. Spies's choice to develop an all-male Czech chorus affirmed the aesthetic appeal of Balinese male bodies. In an even more telling affirmation of this aesthetic, Spies proliferated the Czech chorus, the Sangtiang Czech chorus, to over 100 men and was said to have implanted a gas lamp in the center of the circle to dramatically cast light on the male torsos and faces. He eliminated the Sangtiang girls in trans possession as well as the female Kidong chorus, secular, secularized the form, and added the Ramayana narrative to serve as a dramatic backdrop. These crucial structural changes attributed to Spies as he innovated the Sangtiang Czech chorus into Ketchak pointed to many homoerotic elements. It was clear that his choreographic eye to increase the dramatic impact of Ketchak was driven entirely by a male aesthetic. Having removed the nymphs and female chorus, Spies' visually exciting Ketchak was now wholly male and focused on the spectacle of bare-chested men wearing nothing but a small loincloth. As Asian theater scholar Craig Luttrell noted in his study of the form, the homoerotic markers of this new performance ritual were much too pronounced in Spies' visual and choreographic composition of Ketchak for the development to pass as incidental or, quote, as if the dance had naturally evolved from the earlier Sangtiang, unquote. The spellbinding quality of this spectacle has to be appreciated with Spies' text on the form. Going back to his seminal book, Dance and Drama in Bali, we learned that Ketchak had an, quote, aesthetic ritual character and was embodied by naked swaying bodies, unquote. It was a terrific dance featuring monkey jabberings, squeakings, angry squawks as some invisible monkey sports with another, unquote. Continuing with this Spiesian vision of animus erotics, the, quote, monkeys twine and wrestle, biting, teasing, ceaselessly jabbering. Now the other half swells furiously up against the monkeys. Alternately, they rise against each other in two fierce hosts, each in turn leaning like a great cloud over the above the prostrate group, unquote. The dynamic and mystical physicality of these entwined monkeys was clearly layered with sexual meanings. As one group of Balinese males swelled and leaned on the other prostrate group in fierce action, another was jabbering, wrestling, and entwining. These graphic textual descriptions supplemented Spies' palpably ecstatic photographs about the ritual. In one representative photograph titled the transformation of Ketchak into monkeys, Spies captured the trance-like moment when the male chorus stretched their arms upwards with their digits spread fully apart before the guest lamp. The men with the gaping jaws were mimicking monkeys in a dark and magical atmosphere. It is clear from the photograph aim, that the photograph aimed to convey the visual thrill of Ketchak through the recognizable tropes of the native, featuring in this case erect, male bodies in some kind of animistic possession. As the book would also tell us, the crisp and rhythmic movements in Ketchak were complemented by such native-like affectations such as reiterated bird-like cries. 
without question, these enthralling movements and sounds about the ritual were nativized by the text. More than that, the text also eroticized the male performance with fairly explicit sexual metaphors and innuendos. Um, erect but rising, rising, rising. Horse ejaculations. Broods like some monstrous toad with widespread legs and arms, then rises again to its utmost stretch. In this regard, the circles of Ketchak were also a palpably homoerotic fantasy about Bali and materialized a site in which to channel Waterspeece's desire for the boys. The semiotics of other photographs depicting his life on the island reveals even more monkey business. Smiling wryly, Spies poses with his pet monkey next to images of Balinese men performing as monkeys in Ketchak or crouching around him as innumerable crowds of native male youth in the village. There is an, uh, there is an uncanny and striking resemblance between the mobs of village crowds and the agglomeration of monkeys in Ketchak. In the photographs with the Balinese youth, Spies is nestled among them in the center of these neatly arranged semi-circular group shots staging his exceptional immersion with the Balinese, Balinese males. Then in photographs with his pet monkey, the animal is lovingly cradled in his arm like a baby or perched on his shoulder while he dips in the pool. In the switch between these photographs, a campy semiotic slippage seems to occur between Ketchak monkey, Balinese houseboy, and pet monkey. In the domestic shots um, on your right, where Spies is in the foreground with his pet monkey and parakeet, the brown boy labors in the blurry background as if he was never there, while Spies is all but erased from the shots on Ketchak as if he was never part of his history, uh, as if to preserve the authenticity of a ritual tradition he helped to invent. But these palimpsestic signs are also the clearest indicators of a queer diet working in and around the constraints of colonial hetero-orientalism. The slippage was also part of Spies' affectionate and humorously anthropomorphic fantasies about Bali's mythic and primitive landscapes with him in the foreground and the boy in the background. Spies' appreciation of the Balinese, Javanese, and Sudanese was starkly focused on their bodily appeal. Quote, the people are so incredibly beautiful, so delicately built, brown and aristocratic, that everyone who is not one of them should be ashamed." Unquote. Unlike the prevalent focus on Balinese women by Euro-American painters and photographers, Spies' artistic oeuvre would included sketches of young Javanese and Balinese men bearing erect poses. These would invariably focus on the male head and naked torso, including the individual's boyish face, parched lips, bare skin, and the innocent allure. They gave the paintings a soft, phallic appeal. The expressionistic agrarian landscapes of his painting call into question the natural cosmology of Bali, and, nat and male figures infuse them with a dreamy sacredness and enchanting harmony. At the archives of Leiden University in Holland, his unpublished photography includes a series of solo portrait shots of Balinese men in a variety of languid or martial poses, as well as those that capture the ritual possession of Ketchak dances with an unmistakable spell of kinetic wonder. The collection blurs the line between photography and painting and the way that art, art is archived and vice versa. The singular profile shots of the nameless brown boy cast a different sort of spell, a spell of the onlooker rather than of the subject of the gaze. In fact, many photographs restage the colonial encounter by reversing the Euro-ethnographic hetero gaze on the native boy, creating a witty visual repartee of the natives playing with the camera or onlooker as they peer out of the masks with a wry smile. They are the looks of a queer encounter. I'm sorry, it's my phone.
sorry about that. Um, they are the looks of a queer encounter. It is as if they are smiling, opposing, and peering at the promenation of a tropic spell that has heretofore been without a name or history. So from Bali to Singapore, I moved from Bali now to Singapore, the transmogrification of the classic white men, brown boys, into the post-colonial father state vis-a-vis -vis its gay citizenry presents a conceptual iteration of the diet with its own erotic, juridical, and performative spells. This twist involves unlikely bedfellows, the Singapore father state and partying gay boys, intertwined in queer positions that are sometimes fabulous and sometimes bizarre. For both parties, these are often compromising positions that have a set of requisite, if also incriminating, role play. The state is an unctuous but also leering patriarch, while gay men with sizable disposable incomes are wild, promiscuous boys performing for him in rainbow gear. The diet, to put it bluntly, is now ramified in the cultural policies, national legislature, and queer theaters of a post-colonial Asian city-state, particularly around issues of homosexuality. This inextricable twosome has a long history and is allegorical of the colonial coupling of a yesteryear. Even as the differential power and erotic adjustments of this post-colonial scenario are unique for the diet, the queer encounter of the Singapore father state and its gay populace is curiously conjugated by the tropic spells of the diet in new form, and that is the diet of the brown boys and rice queen conceptually transmogrifying into this bizarre um, diet between the state and its gay citizenry. It is embroiled in the magic of religious, commercial, and state action at once Catholic, contradictory, and world-making for local queers. In other words, the queerness of the colonial diet is regenerated as a complex of disciplinary and neoliberal sexual logics in the, the post-colonial and transnational sites. And with that move from early 20th century Bali to contemporary Singapore across the Java Sea, brown boys have also turned into global Asian queer boys. By the new millennium, the curtains are completely unfurled for the Singapore boy to come out with a paradoxical aura of sexual charge, commercial viability, and objection by the state. From the pink stages of state-funded theaters, global city blueprints, gay saunas, bars and city and parties, to a public pushback campaign by the local Christian right wing against the homosexual agenda, queerness is seemingly ubiquitous rising to a level never seen before in public consumption, visibility, and debate before 2000. Now, if one were to spotlight the boys sashaying the hips on the semiotic catwalks of Singapore's queering, one would see them swishing to one side as fabulous theatrical stars with their tops off, and then to the other side as sodomite criminals caught flagrante delecto with their pants down. I'm referring to the saturation of queer theater and widely disseminated images of its often shirtless or naked male leads on the one hand, and to the retention of the colonial era statute 377A, criminalizing consensual sex between men on the other hand. And so the case study that I have for that chapter has to do with a theatrical trilogy called Asian Boys Volume 1, Volume 2, and Volume 3. And I'm, in, and I'm really interested in figuring out uh, how to intervene in the very dominant uh, discourse called global queering, which is the contention that global, uh, that Western LGBT cultures um, are being disseminated to the rest of the world and helping to emancipate um, sexual minorities in third world countries. Um, and um, I wanted to figure out what are the blind spots of that kind of um, optic uh, that, that kind of discourse, um, and I used uh, uh, this production to think about um, what I'm calling global. Go away. Here. Okay, let's do 
one more time. Susie, marry me. Go with me anywhere I go. Susie Wong is based on British novelist Richard Mason's semi-autobiographical 1957 novel in which Robert Lomax, a 40-something um, white male banker from Britain, goes to Hong Kong to become a full-time painter specializing in native women as his subject. So significantly, Lomax becomes an American in the Broadway play in 1958 and the Hollywood film in 1960, pointing to the seamless transferability of white male privilege. While Hong Kong CD exoticism and colonized charm is his, uh, with Hong Kong CD exoticism and colonized charm as a backdrop, Lomax finds his Asian muse in the form of an alluring but also beguiling 23-year-old Chinese woman with multiple identities. She is Wang Mi Ling, a self-professedly rich virgin girl. When he first encounters her on the ferry boat to Wan Chai, and the feisty hooker who goes by Susie Wong by night. So much of the action happens in the hotel where Lomax lives on, on the top floor. And incidentally, the infamous Nam Kok Bar or Brothel is also located at the hotel. With a sea of slinky Chinese women in Chong Sam entertaining inebriated British and American soldiers, uh, military men, and business executives, Hotel Nam Kok stages the smoky fantasy of Eastern sexual permissiveness with exotic aplomb. So um, I, I go on to do a, a very close reading of uh, Susie Wong, um, but the main uh, chunk of the chapter is devoted to Justin Chin's in reinterpretation of Susie Wong and adaptation of the film, so that Susie Wong has become a has left with Robert, um, with Robert Lomax to go live their lives happily ever after um, in the U.S. And she finds herself in the middle of America, in the middle of nowhere, and has become a desperate housewife, um, while Robert Lomax has become a rice queen and has gone to Thailand um, to find his Thai boy. And so the whole, the whole show is about um, Susie Wong's grievances and unhappiness at being um, abandoned by Robert Lomax. So it's a very campy show, and it's a very, um, uh, uh, a very, I think a very interesting uh, queer critique made by Justin Chin uh, about um, a reinterpretation of an exotic trope. Um, so, uh, in the last, chapter, which is the epilogue, I, I do a reading of a one-woman show by Chin Wen Ping, a Singaporean, Malaysian, American um, playwright and performance artist, uh, to try and circle back on the ways that my readings of the Brown Boys and Rice Queen have also changed the way, that ha have also possibly changed the ways in which we might look at the Brown Woman. So that epilogue was an attempt to rethink um, uh, how we might consider the Asias as a uh, transnational and transcolonial um, site uh, for thinking about uh, Asian performance um, currently. So thank you so much, and I'm very happy to take any questions.
Hi, England. Um, thanks so much for that fantastic talk. Um, I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit more. Um, so in your book, you talk a lot about um, thinking about what the figure or the focus on spells can help us yeah. do in thinking about all the various um, genres and materials within which we see the dyad playing out, right? Um, <clears throat> so thinking about it not in terms of Thinking about the materials that we look at as not merely just textual or merely in terms of the body and performances. Um, so I wanted to ask if you could talk a little bit more about um, your methodology and what it, how it might look for us to work across all these different materials and also try to make sense of one certain materials um, that we're looking for that speak to the relationship of diet might not necessarily be there. Right? Sure. So, um, well, one of the difficulties of, um, you know, doing this project has to do with the ways in which um, there are certain kinds of cultural investments um, from each side, whether it is the East or the West, um, uh, uh, particularly, you know, through the discourse of Orientalism. And um, one of the interventions I'm trying to make in the book is to think about how it isn't so much a scenario in which one is casting, um, you know, a set of spells over the other, but that it is a mutually constitutive encounter, uh, that the spells are cast both ways and is a mutually constitutive fantasy. And so uh, in order to do that, um, you know, I have to incur the consternation and grief of lots of Asian theater scholars who, who are uh, really not, very, who are really protective of a particular way of looking at Ketchak, for instance. And so on the, I, I, re, I write a little bit about this in the book uh, on the um, transnational Balinese listserv, a lot of Balio files were very um, angry that I took a particular angle at looking at this uh, ritual, and there was a pushback by a lot of Balio files and Asian theater scholars um, around how I tried to excavate um, the problematic, the, the queer evidence for thinking about uh, Ketchak's. Um, uh, you know, queer historiography. So, um, one of them, a lot of people um, were very concerned that I was looking at the sordid history of Walter Schwiezer's sex life rather than thinking about the exchange of ideas and the collaboration and the artistic um, kinds of um, work that have been produced as a result of Walter Spies's, um profound contribution in Bali. So there's a way in which there was um, a lot of pushback in order to secure and protect Walter Spies's good name and um, contribution to the Balinese art scene. Uh, however, you know, there, there is a lot of evidence suggesting his, not suggesting, that point to his, his love for the Balinese boys, including um, two, um, you know, two charges of pedophilia, um, one of which, um, you know, um, was significant in terms of Margaret Mead's defense uh, at the court when he, she gave the defense that it is impossible to know how old the Balinese are because they all look so young. So... So there's, you know, there, there are lots of, um, you know, ways to think about the kinds of, you know, investments. Um, the Balinese was also very protective of Balinese, of the Ketchak as a prototypically Balinese form. And so there's a post-colonial claim to the cultural heritage of a ritual uh, that they want to protect. And so they were not very thrilled either <laughs> that I'm excavating this history. Um, but... Ketchak, I think, is very suggestive of the kinds of queer erotics and fantasies that are constitutive of the Western imaginary of Bali as paradise today. It's often seen through the hetero-orientalist framework of Bali as a woman, but less often through the figure of the brown boy. And so I think that 
it's an important diet to consider and to think about the, the implications of this prehistory to the rice queen regime um, that is um, everywhere in the West. Um, and it's not so much an indictment of desire that I'm trying to work here, to work through here. Uh, it's not so much about uh, indicting any kind of fantasy, uh, fantasies that attend to each encounter, but to think about the you know, the spells that are produced as a result of that encounter and the kinds of performances that we might be able, the kinds of uh, questions around performance historiography that we might be able to produce by attending to, um, you know, uh, this, this uh, by attending to um, the diet's performativity um, and it's, histories of encounters around Asia. Additional questions? Hi, Jean. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, Eng Bang, you know I'm a big fan of your work. And um, one of the things, I, I just kind of want to push something a little bit. Yeah. Because one of the <clears throat> things that attracted me so much to the global queering yes. piece and how you develop it is how it starts to problematize that binary of East-West. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you could kind of take a self-critical step back from your book project and talk a little bit about the East-West binary, which does your, do your dyads reinforce that? How do they trouble <clears throat> it? Yeah. And where <clears throat> might we go next? Sure. I think the diet is just one gambit for thinking about post-colonial and transnational coordinates, and I'm not trying to use that as the exemplary encounter for thinking about the very messy geographies that are now part of the transmigratory, transcolonial uh, imaginaries um, that attend to our contemporary moment. So, for instance, in the chapter on Qin Wenping, in my epilogue, I try to, to, prompt, to, to um, think with um, theorists who are invested in uh, transcolonial and minor transnationalism, such as Xu Meishi and Francoise Lyonnais, uh, and use Chu Wenping, who is, has what is at least a tri national identification um, and whose, um, whose migratory passage th through Malaysia, Singapore, and the US point to different transcolonial border zones where the final destination of a lot of migrants are no longer just from point A to B, and that the U.S. is no longer the desired, you know, the desired final destination. That there are returning migrants to the to Asia um, that uh, problematize, you know, a diasporic configuration that are entrenched um, uh, as you know nodal points that are fixed. So, so I think that um, the diet presents an opportunity to problematize, first of all, the hetero-orientalist frameworks that continue to be, um, you know, schooling cultural imaginaries that are popular. And so what would it then mean to even invoke a figure like the brown boy? What would, it, what it, what would, what would that dyadic configuration do to questions of performance historiogra historiography, not just on Asian traditions, but also on intercultural and transnational production projects that are sometimes predicated on these Orientalist um, uh, imaginaries, but are not, they're, they're not called out. So, so if we focus on that, then s certain kinds of artistic collaboration uh, you know, could be called out. <laughs> certain kinds of dance projects, certain kinds of um, theater projects on the international theater arts festival in particular could be called out and uh, how then might this change the way that we receive and read the productions how then might this open up some questions about um, uh, you know discourses on global queering and transnational um, questions around sexuality um, you know could potentially again be opened up if we pay attention to the circulation of this diet, both historically and geographically. Thanks. Questions? 
I was trying to be campy. I don't think I succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> any questions on any of the slides that were presented to us today? <clears throat> You um, you mentioned something about the Asian boy and um, using uh, that as an example to promote human rights in third world countries. Did I understand that right? Can you say that one more time? Um, you had mentioned something about um, <clears throat> the, the Asian boy as uh, an example to promote uh, human rights in third world countries. Uh, yeah, yes. something like that. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I wasn't sure exactly what you were... Sure. Your meaning. I think you're referring to the Singapore, the chapter on Singapore, where I was looking at the uh, theatrical trilogies called Asian Boys, Volume One, Two, and Three, um, and the intervention that I'm trying to make around the discourse of global queering, which purports that Western LGBT um, cultures and a rights-based kind of discourse. Uh, around uh, LGBT uh, identities are being disseminated to the rest of the world and helping to liberate third world country, uh, sex sexual minorities in third world countries. So in the case of Singapore, that kind of postulation seems to be problematic. And uh, the gambit here is it's not just Sing Singapore is not just exceptional, that it is problematic everywhere <laughs> to think about how this is an emancipatory um, discourse. So um, the example that I focused on, focused on uh, in Singapore is around the uh, Victorian era statutes 377, which is a clause that criminalizes sex between uh, you know men based on um, it's, a, it, it's a sodomy uh, it, a law against sodomy. And what's really interesting about this case is that the the minority. Evangelical right, evangelical right wing in Singapore emerged as a very vocal uh, power um, by figures such as a law professor, Theo Lee An, who was campaigning very hard to retain the clause provide, uh, with provisions against, um, against anal sex for homosexuals but wanted to repeal the provisions for heterosexuals. And she was, in a very spectacular way, able to succeed <laughs> pushing through that agenda so that um, that clause only applies to homosexuals. So, so, uh, you know, so working through that example points to the kinds of contradictions and discrepancies around how the emancipatory logics of Western uh, uh, rights based kinds of campaigns do not always um, result in a positive outcome for, um, for um, cities like Singapore. Yes, Lisa. Thank you, Ing Bing, for your book. Um, I have a question um, that is kind of linked to um, Jean's question yep. that she had already asked. Um, so I see your book as a kind of anti-hegemonic move, right, against um, perhaps the Western gaze, if you'd like to, um, if, if you'd like to see it that way. And I'm really interested in the epilogue because it seems to be a beginning of most of a new project when you talk about the figure of the minor native in a transnational and transcolonial frameworks. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that can take us, you know, working in um, post-colonial studies or Asian studies or any kind of, you know, marginal minority studies? Um, how would that move forward in other projects? Oh, that's a really good question. Maybe you guys can help me with my um, second and third project. Um, <laughs> well, I'm currently trying to think through um, three archives, that one of which is based on the Balinese encounter. Um, that's, the, that's the second site of a again, a three-site uh, project um, in which Colin McPhee, Walter Spies, um, you know, I went to the archives at Leiden as well as UCLA that have um, a special collection of Colin McPhee's photography from the 30s when he was there. And I found in each archive a secret tre uh, trove of photographs that uh, both of them have, have taken of boys 
in various kinds of provocative but also rather campy poses involving uh, these boys crouching as tigers, barely clothed on trees, or holding an orchid that's sprouting out flowers in front of the groin. And they're often staged in a really interesting way. And the fact that they are not published and they are part of their personal collection in the uh, archives um, makes me wonder about you know the um, the ways that the charges against them during the time for pedophilia could have arisen from some of these images. So, so that's one side, and I'm trying to think about the prehistory of that um, photography project in the um, 19th century when a German photographer by the name of Willem van Gleuden went to Sicily and started taking pictures of uh, dark-skinned Italian boys and staged them using Greek icon classical Greek iconography, so found drapery and leaves on the ears. Um, and these are boys without any kind of muscle. They're kind of, you know, they're not Adonis figures. They are just ordinary boys staged in the likes of Greek gods. And he found great success in the art world, and his photography was exhibited all around Europe and found great acclaim. Um, and his work, I argue, enabled a diaspora of European photographers and artists to do the kind of work in Bali, which was then seen as morally objectionable and pedophilic. So what is interesting to me is the disconnect between a kind of inter- European exoticization and fetishization that's happening between the Germans and the Italians, and then the kind of ob objectionable um, work that crosses um, the East and West. Um, and the third side has to do with returning Asian American artists in Southeast Asia who then produce a number of in, uh, uh, photographic installations involving fabricated boy bands, such as Viet Le and others, um, using the trope of exotic boyhoods to stage these uh, playful uh, reinterpretation of global Asian masculinity. So these are th these you know are three sites for, for me to think through um, what what is going on in terms of the kinds of exotic boyhoods that imagine across time and place. Um, and I'm at the beginning part of the, this project. I. I it's, you know, the, the epilogue in the book was an attempt to stage a, a conversation between um, minor transnational studies, Asian American studies, as well as post-colonial studies, to think about how the vocabularies that we use to talk about race and sexuality have to be extended um, beyond the specificities of one site. And so how do we do that? And, and um, the uh, you know the the transcolonial uh, border zones of the minor native is one way for me to think about the comparativity of um, uh, multiple sites and to see how I could assemble a hermeneutics for understanding um, something like Chin Wen Ping's performance, so that she is not just an Asian American artist, not just a Singapore Malaysian artist or not just an artist in circulation around the world as uh, on the cosmopolitan theater circuit, but all of the above. So then how then do we understand this performance? How do we, how do we name it? How do we understand it? your work uh, relates to gay tourism and also the perspective of, of Asian societies and individuals on gay tourism, um, on if there's a sort of notion of, of homosexuality as a sort of Western import into Asian cultures, how that kind of figures in and what, what goes on there. Well, 
Uh, well, the case of Singapore presents an interesting, um, some interesting <clears throat> answers. Um, in the in the early years of the new millennium, when Asian Boys Volume One, Two, and Three uh, was part of a saturation of queer theater in Singapore, um, the government was also very busily trying to have a global city makeover of Singapore as the cultural epicenter of Asia. And so pink capitalism and pink tourism became the uh, pieces that the um, government really focused on um, to enable this sexy makeover of a draconian father state. So for many years, Singapore was uh, deemed to be Asia's new gay capital. And as part of that transformation, um, pink tourism and gay uh, and lesbian um, tourists swarmed the country for various festivals, such as the Nation Parade, which is a pre-Independence Day celebration by the gay and lesbian activists uh, as a kind of kind of a uh, parallel uh, pink celebration of the father state. Um, and it involves various kinds of um, swimming pool parties and you know, all kinds of uh, theater shows and, 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 and bars opened up for, that, for those events. And tourists came from all over the world, from Taiwan, Australia, Europe, the US. And for many years, it became a, you know, a central part of um, the, the, uh, the city-state's makeover, sex makeover. Um, and with that, um, with that transformation, um, bathhouses, bars, theaters uh, proliferated in great numbers. Um, but that was a short-lived experiment. Um, in, a, in a few years later, uh, Lee Sien Long took over the, um, the administration from Go Chok Tong, who's deemed to be a more open, <laughs> embracing prime minister, and they immediately shut down many of these um, these events, circuit parties. Um, there were forces um, from the right, from the right wing Christian evangelicals, to um, ministers who um, who make claims around how these parties are spreading AIDS that really shut down <laughs> the, um, the revelers. So, and the party just shifted over to Phuket, Thailand, and all the gays went over <laughs> to <laughs> Thailand. So now it's become like a circuit around Asia. Hong Kong, now Taipei is, is all the rage, and people go to Taipei <laughs> for those parties. Uh, for a while it was Hong Kong, for a while it was Singapore. Thailand continues to be a mainstay, so there's a kind of circuit of of um, pink tourism in Asia by the um, you know very well um, by the um, gay elites, if you will. <clears throat> uh, okay. Um, so um, I was I was just um, I was interested in the ped pedophilia stuff that you were talking about because um, I'm also sort of working on this white um, colonist in the Philippines and it, he seems periodically to be accused of pedophilia and um, it just seems to be part of the colonial matrix which I think is part of what you're getting at um, but I'm just also wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you see um, how you see that functioning and circulating and how, like, where were the charges coming from? Uh, not, not just literally, like, what exactly happened with this guy, but, but what are the consequences of thinking about um, hmm. these sort of lone white colonizers in... Low white? Lone. Like, I don't, I don't know if your guy was kind of um, one of the few white men in the area or white people in the area, but um, the one that I'm studying is... And, and it seems to be linked to the ways that he is sexualizing um, 
Filipino boys in the case that I'm looking at. Anyways, I just wondered if you have more to say about that, or maybe not. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I guess I'm in conversation with um, Joseph Boone, who um, has written extensively about the homoerotics of Orientalism and has a book just out about, about that. Um, and in the case of Spies in Bali, there was a whole colony of um, expatriate homosexuals from Europe, Colin McPhee, uh, um, you know, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there's a whole colony of um, artists, ethnographers, writers, choreographers who were part of his salon and who had a lot of fun <laughs> uh, during the time there. Um, and part of the witch hunt against them was, was both politically and religiously um, motivated. So, the, um, you know, Spies was a German living in the Dutch colony during World War II, and the um, Netherlands at that time was also um, much more conservative, and their Christian um, right-wing witch hunt um, was behind the crackdown. Um, and they wanted to shut down the perceived hedonism that's uh, happening in, at that site. So there's a, there's a con convergence of factors that led to the incarceration of Spies and the exodus of these um, um, artists um, from, from the island um, in the 30s and 40s. So um, how, what do I think of this project about their you know, I. You know, I don't. I, I'm not so much. I'm not as interested in the um, the 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 moral charges against their against their proclivities as much as I am um, interested in thinking about how their um, you know their desire right is shaped. By um, you know the homoerotic, homoerotic, homoerotic fantasies that attend to uh, Orientalist constructions. So I'm interested in how um, they were part of um, a, an artistic enclave that helped to skew the Dutch colonial makeover of Bali as paradise. How that makeover project, like the one in Singapore, was uh, facilitated. By, um, by queer elements. So how do we think about this issue, not necessarily as a complicity kind of model, but thinking about how you know, they are part of its constitution? Um, and does that then change the ways in which we think about, um, you know, uh, about the um, valence of um, you know queer encounters. How do we think about that <laughs> and its circulation? Ha, ha, ha.